want some water? Is that yours? Okay. Hallo? Huhu. Soll ich einfach reden? Okay. Um, I would like to introduce... Excuse me? Hello. Thank you very much. Good. I would like to introduce our next speaker. He, his name is Justin Perkins. He works at Care2. It's a very big... Um, one of the largest global social networks of uh, networks of activists in the U.S. has a lot, lots of members. He's been work. As, um, can you hear me properly? I, I can hear myself double. Okay. Um, Care2 has been around for around for roughly 10 years, and Justin has been involved for about four. He's going to talk about online strategies for NGOs, and as you see, he has a very provocative title. Are you ready to reach 100,000 people tomorrow morning? So let's see how, how you can do that. Okay. Good morning, thank you. Um, thanks for having me all the way over here to Germany. Um, I live in Colorado and um, have been in the, uh, the EU for about uh, three weeks. It's been fascinating to uh, see the differences in terms of um, where the industry, the nonprofit sector is uh, in terms of online campaigning and fundraising. So um, this is a, a question that I often ask my clients when I work with NGOs. And um, more often than not, the answer to this question is a resounding no. Um, and this is really what the potential is for online campaigning. This has become more and more easy to do nowadays. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, different themes around this question and how to make this happen and um, give you some very uh, uh, interesting things to think about in terms of strategy for how, how to achieve this, this goal. Um, so CARE2 had the opportunity to actually uh, reach 600,000 people in a day. Um, we had uh, done quite a, bit of, quite a bit of work over a, a number of years to grow a, a very large activist list of animal rights activists. and. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of you may remember Hurricane Katrina, which hit the U.S. Uh, about four years ago. <clears throat> and during that uh, hurricane, that disaster, there were thousands of pets that were uh, stranded and uh, left without homes. Uh, their, their, their owners had fled for their lives and abandoned them. Um, so there was an organization in the U.S. called American Humane. Um, they do a lot of animal, animal relief work. Um, and they, they hired us because we had the biggest animals list to be able to reach out and do a fundraising campaign. And um, within just uh, about 48 hours, we had raised $200,000. Um, I'll repeat that. Within 48 hours, we had raised $200,000. So in that very short time period, in that one campaign, we had actually recouped, recouped probably all of the investment and all of the work that Care2 had done to build this army of activists over a couple of years. Um, and so that's really the potential here. This is the, the message I would like you to leave with today. Um, there's a huge potential in Germany that's still untapped for reaching this kind of success. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, so three things that we're going to discuss today. Be, prepare, be prepared to be lucky. Um, that's one of my, my uh, mottos in life. I've seen so many successful people and so many organizations that are success, successful uh, because they, they do the hard work that's necessary, they make the smart choices to be prepared for opportunity, be prepared, prepared to be lucky. Um, secondly, you need to choose the right tool for the right purpose. Um, we'll get more into that. And third, you need to meet the needs of your supporters. This is not about you. This is about the people, the grassroots supporters that you're campaigning for to reach your mission. It's not about you. It's not about your organization. It's about your supporters and your customers. <clears throat> a little bit about CARE2. Um, been around since 1998 and have sort of grown under the radar to be the largest online social network for activists and people that care about healthy and green living um, and the environment and social justice. And um, this is our nice little stock photo version of CARE2. Um, our audience is heavily female, uh, about 70% female. And then uh, it was uh, kind of a fun story. When I arrived in Berlin last week, um, 
I came to stay with uh, my wife's host sister when she lived in Germany many years ago. And uh, she's formerly from the, the GDR. Um, she's now a documentary filmmaker. Her name's Anna. She lives in Berlin. And she, was, uh, she made the film uh, Football Undercover. Has anybody heard of this? Um, it's about uh, soccer, a soccer match in Iran. Um, uh, but anyway, um, she was a member of CARE 2, coincidentally. Um, <laughs> and so it was kind of fun to come to Germany and find a, somebody who actively subscribes and, and gets uh, action alerts from CARE 2 and uses the website. Um, <clears throat> so just uh, briefly, what I do with CARE 2 is I help nonprofits and NGOs um, recruit thousands or hundreds of thousands of people every year. Um, in the past four years I've been doing this, I've worked with about 150 different nonprofits and helped recruit about uh, over one million supporters that have um, become strong activists and donors for a number of uh, organizations. And um, looked at uh, our membership base in Germany before I came over here. We have about 60,000 uh, Action Alert subscribers as well as 30,000 active uh, subscribers to those action alerts. Um, and that's without doing any campaigns in Germany. So this has all been a very word of mouth phenomenon of people who have found issues that they care about and then they will receive emails and sign up for newsletters and action alerts or become active with the social networking tools and then tell their friends about it and um, spread the word virally. We've done zero, zero marketing. It's all happened word of mouth. And I'll tell you a little bit about why that's happened in this, in this presentation and how that's happened. Um, and as a result of that, we've helped NGOs, um, primarily in the U.S., but we're starting to work more internationally. Um, we've really driven the growth of the online fundraising and activism in, in the NGO sector in the U.S. Um, so be prepared to be lucky. Um, it sounds kind of funny, but um, this is something that goes back to quotes from as far back as Thomas Jefferson, who was one of the founders of um, uh, the United States. And... Uh, this, you know, if you look across the world of famous people, um, including uh, Oprah Winfrey, has anybody heard of Oprah? <laughs> so luck happens when, when preparation meets opportunity. And uh, I can't tell you how important this is. I think uh, there's a very strong, uh, very strong calling that all of you have here as, as organizers, fundraisers, campaigners. Um, very, very important. You were sort of the key link to your organization and the future of your organization and the, the chance for your organizations to actually achieve their missions. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to tell you a very sad story of what didn't happen. Um, so this is, anybody know who this is? Raise your hands. Okay, thank you. Mohammed Yunus, he won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for his amazing work um, in uh, Bangladesh in developing what's called the Grameen Bank, and uh, that essentially uh, flipped the whole financial model on its, on its head and, and, and enabled uh, micro entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs to be able to make livelihoods um, and it's completely uh, revitalized the, the, the possibilities for the developing world. So um, naturally, he won the Nobel Prize in 2006. Um, so here's the sad story. Um, there is a, an NGO that uh, had a beautiful opportunity to capitalize on this moment for you know, microenterprises in the news. Um, Muhammad Yunus is all over, the, all over the media in terms of his interviews for winning the Nobel Prize. But this organization was not ready to capitalize on that lucky opportunity. Um, they only had about 10,000 people on their email list. Um, despite having a very full marketing team, they had uh, a VP of marketing, a director of marketing, and two online campaigners dedicated to online marketing. Um, but they were thinking very small. They were scared to invest money. They were scared to invest times. They were following sort of the latest uh, hype, like, oh, we should just build a Facebook page and the world will be a better place. Um, so they missed this opportunity. I happen to know sort of the inside story because I was trying to convince them to not miss this opportunity, and they did. They didn't listen to me. As a result, they still only have um, 10,000, or they have about 20,000 people on their email list now, and that's uh, three years later, four years later. Um, they did not raise $100,000 in a week online, which they could have um, if they were ready. They did not grow their email list by over 100,000 people in a year, which they could have if they had been ready. 
They did not prepare the organization to make recurring revenue of $100,000 to $400,000 if they had been ready. And um, more importantly, they missed out on helping thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs who could have benefited from them doing their jobs just a little bit better. It wasn't rocket science. All they needed to do was follow best practices, which have been proven now over the last 10 years in the US. The information's there. The tools are there. The data is there. The case studies are there. The benchmarks are there. And they didn't follow them. So this is the sad story. There are happier stories to come. Um, I want to emphasize that keep at the, the center of whatever you're doing online um, your mission, your goal. Keep these people, the faces of the people you're trying to help in mind. Um, this is a picture of uh, these street kids that I, uh, I snapped um, when I was on a study, a study abroad in Brazil uh, back in 1998. And uh, I, keep, uh, I keep these photos with me to remember why I do kind of what I do. Um, so whatever your mission is, whether it's animal rights or the environment, um, this was a beautiful moment I had in uh, Costa Rica where I got to see the sea turtles come in um, and, and lay their eggs. Um, keep, keep these stories and these images in your mind as you do your work. Um, <clears throat> so when you get frustrated with your bosses who say, well, you know, we shouldn't grow our email list or we shouldn't build a Facebook page, um, you know, keep these, keep these inspiring stories in, in your back pocket to remember why you do what you do and it'll help you fight. Um, so here's the huge potential growth that's possible uh, for Germany. Uh, I was talking with uh, Robert from Oxfam last night and, and just doing some quick back of the envelope um, uh, comparisons just to kind of get a sense of where Germany is in terms of the NGO sector and capacity uh, for fundraising. So um, Robert shared with me that you know, Oxfam and Greenpeace are, are two of the, well, Oxfam, Greenpeace, NABU, and WWF are four of the, four of the largest uh, organizations here. So um, we guessed that Oxfam has about 20,000 people on their email list, which is about 0.02% of uh, the population of Germany, which is about 80 million. And uh, Greenpeace, as you can see, has about 100,000 people on their email list. That's a guess. If anybody is here from Greenpeace, you feel free to correct me. Um, so that's about 0.1% of Germany's population. So contrast that with the counterparts in the US that have been you know, doing this for the last five years. Um, Oxfam US, uh, who we've done quite a bit of work with, has uh, over 500,000 people on their email list. They, they're getting to the point of raising a uh, million dollars a year. And they've acquired about 0.2% of the entire US population. Um, so you can kind of read through the rest and get the point is that um, relative to size of population, you have barely scratched the surface. You've barely even started. Um, and that's amazing. That's a huge potential. And you're lucky. I'm jealous because you now have 10 years of proven, proven data, proven case studies, tool development, all of this investment that's happened over where I come from. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. All you have to do is steal our tactics. Simple. Um, you could be up and running in probably about a week if, uh, if you needed to. And you, all you have to do is just follow the best practices. Um, so <clears throat> and this is, the, uh, this is what we all dream of, I suppose. Campaigners, maybe not as much as the Eagle fundraisers. But uh, um, this, is, this is what's possible. It really is. There's a proven business model here. And uh, what's great is that the campaigners are very, very key to this particular goal, how to raise, how to raise money online. Um, we're seeing that there's about a, 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 a huge overlap between campaigners and fundraisers. And if you are cultivating your email lists and your Facebook groups and your, your supporters through campaigning, through activism, they're about three times more likely to donate. So there's a great tagline for your bosses right there. If you fund our campaigns, those campaigners will be three times more likely to donate. So hopefully that'll get you some more budget. Um, so when you go back to your organizations, here's, here's one very simple thing for you to do. Make this actionable. Um, do this sort of, do an exercise with your team or even by yourself if you work on your own. Um, think of an opportunity or a crisis that uh, either has happened for your organization or will happen. So perfect example, Haiti. Um, the first groups out during Haiti, the first groups to get the message out raised the most money. It was simple. We saw it happen on CARE2. Um, we saw it happen with probably about uh, a dozen of our partners, um, Oxfam and um, CARE and UNICEF and all these massive uh, relief groups. 
Uh, it was the groups that had the biggest list ready to pull the trigger. They were the ones that capitalized the most quickly. And often that, their entire vest investment over a year could be paid back in, in one moment. Um, so go back and do this thought exercise when you get, when you get home, or even do it uh, for the, throughout the rest of the day. Think of a crisis or an opportunity that your organization is likely to have, okay? And I, I can probably come up with an example for every single organization. Don't just say, don't make, don't make any excuses and say, well, we're not a relief group. Well, neither was, um, neither was the, the NGO that works on microfinance. They have a very boring issue, actually. But their window of opportunity was a massive news story. So that's, that's, a, that's a good chance. Or um, it could be that somebody, uh, a matching donor, um, says, OK, we have 100,000 euros. And if you get uh, 100,000 euros from your grassroots campaigners, uh, we will match that. And you can instantly double your money. Or maybe there's a, like a social network contest that you need to win. So all of these opportunities, when they come up, it's too late to build your list. You've got to start like a year ahead. OK. Second point, right tool for the right purpose. Has anybody heard of Maslow? Hierarchy of needs, um, psychologist from the US, 1950s. Uh, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. Um, so when I'm working with uh, hundreds of NGOs, uh, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to see the same, re same mistakes repeated over and over and over. And it comes down to a very simple question. Why? <laughs> Why do you need a Facebook page? Why do you need a Twitter account? What's the purpose? What's the objective? And then, what's the tool that would most effectively meet that objective? And what's the tool, this is the important part, what's the tool that has been proven already to meet that objective? Unless you have time, unless you have a huge budget, and unless you have time to experiment, okay? So, um, this poor fellow was trying to make this tree grow by playing bagpipes to it. Um, and all he needed to do was add water. Um, so here's, here's the toolbox, right? This is the, the tools that uh, organizations, NGOs have at their disposal. Um, so direct mail, action alerts, uh, petitions, newsletters, social networks, Twitter, MySpace, YouTube, Facebook, <laughs> blogs, press, rele press releases, videos. Uh, it's kind of mind boggling actually. Um, but not all of these tools are created equally, and not all of them are going to work for the same purpose. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you a very stark example of this. Um, and this is the important question to ask. Um, if an investment does not have a positive return on investment, or if there's a better opportunity with a higher return on investment, then the investment should not be undertaken. It's pretty logical. but. None of us do it. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, and <clears throat> for those of you who like math, um, there's actually a formula called return on investment. Um, it would, this is one of the most important slides in this whole presentation because uh, nobody does this. Uh, nobody thinks about this ahead of time. <clears throat> Think about your campaign. Look at case studies that are out there. Look at benchmark reports. There are some published. And say, OK, what is possible for this campaign for the size of the list that I have uh, how much money is it going to cost compared to other organizations that have already done this? And what's the potential for return? Um, so anyway, it's very easy to look up this, this term online. Uh, you'll find it very quickly in the formula. And then um, this is a, a very concrete example of return on investment. So what is this? Okay. So on the, uh, the y-axis, you have total cause members on Facebook causes, okay? So everybody know what Facebook causes is. <clears throat> it's a, a tool that was created for peer-to-peer -peer fundraising on Facebook. Okay, and then on the x-axis, you have the, the number of groups in the data sample. Um, so this is a study I did uh, about a year ago. Uh, it was a follow-up to a study I had done six months after Facebook causes launched. I wanted to see what was possible. So um, I wanted to see which organizations that had the most followers, the most cause members, I wanted to see how much money they were raising. Because there seemed to be you know, an obvious correlation between size of, your, size of your following, size of your list, and the amount of money that you could raise. 
So here's what I found. Um, there were only 500 groups out of about 180,000 that had more than 20,000 cause members, okay? Um, there were only two groups that had, uh, if you can see those little red blips at the, on the x-axis, there were only two uh, groups that had raised more than $100,000, okay? Of those groups, um, the majority, more than 50% of that money had come from two people. One of those people was part of the organization, so it was totally inflated. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the other person may have been a friend of the organization or a random. So, um, so this was the, rea the reality. I was like, I was totally shocked because it was like, I'm watching hundreds, probably thousands of organizations, well, sorry, 180,000 causes. That means somewhere in the order of 10,000 to 20,000 organizations, or I don't know, maybe even more because organizations could have multiple causes. So I was watching this phenomenon happen where uh, all of these organizations were rushing to have a Facebook cause, but nobody asked this question. So, okay, so this blogger uh, at a foundation called Taproot Foundation, he did some back of the envelope math and he said, okay, he tried bu building a cause and he tries to raise money on it. And he said, okay, that, that was roughly a, a, a one to 100 ratio. So in other words, I spent $100 and I got $1 back. $100 worth of time and I got $1 back. So um, that's not rocket science math, that's really, really low return on investment. <laughs> so multiply that across the entire nonprofit sector and that was just a huge waste of time. A huge mistrust of your uh, supporters' uh, funds and efforts and a huge, huge failure, okay? And this is still being replicated right now. Everybody's still kind of rushing for this, like a bunch of lemmings. Um, so the point is, um, uh, here's using the right tool for the right purpose. Um, there's a very proven model with email fundraising. Um, it's driving most of the fundraising online in, in the US at least, and there's no reason that shouldn't happen here. Um, in fact, uh, more people are online in Germany than in the US per, by a percentage basis. I think it's 80% of the population here is connected. <clears throat> so look at the look at the contrast in numbers. Um, over one million email subscribers uh, on Saved Our Fours list. They'd spent maybe a year and a half or two years building up this list through lots of paid advertising, through lots of campaigning, petitions, using all of the tools in the book. In uh, a matter of sending three emails in one week, they raised over four hundred fifteen thousand dollars. One week, <clears throat> from an equal number of people on Facebook causes. Uh, it took them over one year to raise $28,000. And again, that was probably from um, the top six donors was the majority of that $28,000. So right tool for the right strategy. Um, you can raise 50 to 200 times more money via email than through an equivalent social network list. So think about that. Um, if your organization right now is spending more time playing with social networks than building an email list, um, that's a misuse of uh, company resources and time. And so it's not, it's not doing justice to the children you're trying to save or the animals you're trying to save or what have you. So social networks have an awesome, awesome place in this whole equation, so we'll get more to that. I'm not dissing social networks. Right tool for the right purpose. Social networks are great for branding and learning about your audience and connecting and connecting with younger audiences, et cetera. Um, so just to give you a little more data about email fundraising, this is from a benchmark study that was released in 2008 um, by a, a company called Convio. They're an ECRM provider um, for probably a thousand different major NGOs. So they have a lot of data to look at. Um, <clears throat> uh, groups with uh, just 10,000 people on their email list were able to raise about $47,000 on average. If you looked at Facebook causes or Twitter groups, wouldn't even scratch that. Um, there's probably one or two cases of you know really interesting examples of social networks where, like during like uh, Katrina or during um, uh, Haiti, where the Red Cross raised a, a ton of money through Twitter, and you know the like this group called Charity Water in the U.S. raised a bunch of money through the Twestables using Twitter. Those are very 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 rare examples. It's about as uh, the chances of that happening is about as good as becoming a rock star, or probably even worse. <laughs> so um, just think about the right tool for the right strategy. Um, 
If you want to raise money online, if you want to engage activists where they are, it's actually email. Um, and then you can start to leverage email to reach social networks. There's some really interesting strategies and campaigns happening with data pending and, and finding people through leveraging your email lists. Um, so I'm going to disagree uh, strongly with the last speaker's comment about Ning. Um, I, I've seen several groups over all the, the clients I've worked with who've tried to build their own social networks. Um, and the reason they fail um, probably 99 times out of 100 is because they don't have a critical mass. Um, so that's the opportunity that these larger social networks have is that the people are already there. So it's a matter of segmenting and, and, and then doing what you do on the internet anyway be interesting, tell stories, attract people, um, and you're going to find people more readily than trying to hoard them on your website. That's very web 1.0, that's very like 1998 um, to try and bring all the traffic to your website. It just doesn't work unless you're like Greenpeace International and you have a massive following. So that's uh, my one, one point that I really want to strongly make is, uh, and actually I think Greenpeace is doing a, a case study on this later, I, I heard. So that'll be interesting to hear what their, what their take is on this. But just from, from what I've seen, um, it's very difficult to, to create a critical mass of a social network. And we, Care2 is actually a social network, and I've seen that happen with our site. It wasn't until we got to about a million people that um, the social network started to become fairly robust. And even at that, it's, you know, you're looking at the 99-1 rule. So um, you know, maybe 1% of, or, yeah, 1 of the entire audience base will actually do something on the social network. There might be some lurkers, like 10% who lurk and kind of will sign up, but they won't do anything. So it's really that 1%. So think, you know, back into that number, how many people do you need to actually do something interesting? It's probably going to be more than 10 people. Um, so don't be a lemming. Think really carefully about the important role that you have in your organization. You are kind of the, you are like the gatekeepers to the future here. <laughs> And uh, I, I'm tired of, of money being thrown away because there are all these great causes out there that are not realizing their potential. So you have, you have the potential in this room, the smarts, the knowledge, the tools, the skills to actually pull off some really massive uh, campaigns. Um, it's not rocket science and you all have the tools to do it. I think it's just going to take thinking a little bit bigger and not listening to people who tell you you can't do it. Um, and so then this is kind of the holy grail of tools right here. Um, this is what I'm seeing organizations in the U.S. who have been at this for five or ten years getting to the point where they have these, these massive campaigning and, and, and fundraising machines. And it, it, to be honest, it is a numbers game um, if you really want to have impact. And sometimes our, our, our sort of natural instinct to be really sincere about campaigning actually works against our, uh, our goal. So think about it uh, as, in terms of, you know, how are you limiting your campaign by your own beliefs in terms of, well, this must be true and pure and... Well, campaigning can also be a tactic to get the organization to a, a, a further point so that the next campaign you have a much bigger impact and that's going to achieve your mission. So don't limit yourself by being too purist about this. Um, these are tools and tactics. They're not going to save, any single one of them is not going to save the world in one shot. It's, it's all steps toward a bigger goal. So getting to this point where you integrate all of your different mediums is really what's starting to have the biggest impact because if you think about it, um, you know, we're all ingesting different types of media now at a rate never before seen in history. So we have to use all these different tactics to really reach people in the medium that they prefer. And uh, email is actually the most, uh, is the easiest way to integrate all of this because most people spend all of their days sitting in front of a computer, uh, at least working people who have money that could donate. Um, and uh, most people have cell phones now. So, uh, and you can find cell phone numbers by appending data to email. And I'm not going to get into the ethics of that because it's a different discussion. Let's just say it's possible. And the smart organizations that are making money and achieving their missions are tending to do more and more of these tactics. Okay. So to do, when you get back, or later today, or right now, make a list of your goals. And then think really carefully about the tools that are the best uh, to, to reach those goals. So if you're just trying to do campaigning, Think about the best tools for that. Maybe it's social networks um, if you have a critical mass of people. Maybe it's email and using a, an ECRM tool that has a, like a petition tool built into it. Um, whatever that tool is, you really need to think through it. And look, uh, you don't have to reinvent this. There's lots of case studies. 
Um, this blog that I launched for care Two about four years ago, it has a ton of best practices and case studies from guest experts across the sector. And uh, we, we try to capture all of the published benchmark studies on that URL right there, frogloop.com slash benchmarks. Okay. So, right tool, and now maybe the most important part of this speech is talking about messaging, because you can have all the tools you want, and you can have the most brilliant strategy, but if your messaging sucks, forget about it. Um, so, <clears throat> this made me laugh out loud when I saw it, because uh, have you ever been to, like, the, there's sort of this culture in more, uh, more bohemian uh, cities, you know, like to have sort of these message boards where people post jobs or like a flat for sale. Um, so anyway, um, right tool and the right message and the right time. And uh, you don't want people to think they're signing up for your email list just to get some really boring uh, message like a blank piece of paper. Okay, meet the needs of your supporters and they'll help you to meet your needs. Put your customers first, put your campaigners first, your activists first. So, um, <clears throat> kind of a random collection of quotes, but um, motivation is the art of getting people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it. Um, so that's really, really key here, is that you are not necessarily the center of this story, of this uh, activist story that's happening, the storyline that happens with every campaign. It's really the, the campaigners, the grassroots activists that are at the center of this. Um, so it's thinking about ways to motivate them um, by figuring out what they want to do and why they're doing it. Um, so three human needs that you should meet. And this is actually, a, um, I was reading more, a bit, more about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, it was interesting because these meet, meet kind of the level three and level four needs of uh, self, towards self-actualization and finding meaning. So most of the people that you're probably trying to reach online have already figured out how to eat and, and they, you know, they're not worried about their next meal. Their basic needs are met. So they're more looking for ways to be part of groups. They're looking for self-actualization, a way to have their voice hear, heard, and a way to be creative. So that's the key. This is why Care2 has grown to 13 million people. It's because we figured out how to do this. And this is the key. <laughs> Does anybody know who this band is? I've been trying to figure it out for like three years. Anyone? Please. Sweet. What is it? Sweet? Is it? I don't know. I've got to find out. So if anybody knows, please, please email me. Okay, so the need to be part of a group. Rock musicians have totally figured this out. Um, if you think about every rock concert you've been to, you know, they're creating an experience where you're part of this movement. And it's actually, the trick is, the songs are about you, the person that goes to the concert. It's not about the musician. It's the emotions and the experiences and the memories and the stories that are invoked from that experience of connecting with a group of people around music. Um, a very, very basic visceral thing and that's something that we can recreate online as well. Um, anybody familiar with this campaign? Might hear about it today from Greenpeace. Um, so the need to be creative, right? Um, Greenpeace is brilliant at, at, at in enabling and empowering their activists to do really cool stuff. And, um, you know, this is a brilliant campaign that just went gangbusters over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, you know, it was huge amounts of creativity that Greenpeace uses in their campaigns. Um, and as a result, the campaigns do really well. And then um, this is one of my favorite stories uh, about the need to sort of raise your voice. But also is about, it's also about being creative and it's also about, um, you know, being part of a group. And this works on CARE2, for example, because all of the petitions, we actually have the largest petition site in the world. And all of the petitions that people sign, you have an opportunity to leave a comment so that everybody else signing the petition can see your comments. Very, very important point. Um, because people want to be able to raise their voice, not just, not just sign a petition, but they actually want to have their particular view on the world seen by others. Um, so, Ian, uh, which is in the Netherlands, sort of a, the Netherlands version of one campaign, did this brilliant campaign a couple of years ago. You can read about it on Frog Loop. Um, just search for Ian. And um, what they did is they took uh, all of these online activists and they created real life avatars for these online activists who signed up. And then they uh, transported these uh, avatars to Washington, D.C. and did this massive online offline protest in front of the World Bank. Um, brilliant. And uh, I think the, the numbers, I don't remember off the top of my head, it's on the blog, Frog Loop, um, but they, they were really impressive. I mean, it was in the hundreds of thousands um, of people who had 
connected through hives and a lot of different mediums in, uh, online, and then this translated into a, a really cool offline protest. So again, it's uh, you know meeting three needs. It's uh, it's also about telling stories. So being part of a group, um, being part of a group, the need to be creative and the need to to have your voice heard. All those things are important. And stories and campaigns are perfect for, for evoking all of those things because you're essentially storytellers as campaigners. You have some sort of evil that your campaign is trying to fight, okay? Now, where most NGOs get this wrong is that they put themselves as the hero, okay? And the key is to put your activists as the heroes. These are your everyday heroes. And so you need to think about writing your stories so that uh, me at the rock concert, I'm, it's all about me. It's all about me uh, consuming the media. It's, it's all about the activists who are reading your emails or seeing your Twitter posts or seeing your Facebook posts. Um, that's the key here. Um, they're the ones who need to be inspired, who need to feel good, who need to have their guilt relieved. Um, whatever it is, you need to figure out what those needs are that need to be met. So very specific uh, example and um, this is our standard format for an action alert that we send. We send probably, gosh, um, we have about three million activists on action alerts and we send maybe a couple hundred thousand uh, emails every single day to, for about 60 different nonprofit organizations where we're doing campaigns for them. Um, so this is an example, uh, just real quick to walk through some very specific. So um, this was for a contest we were promoting uh, for animal shelters and um, you can see this is the overall format of the emails that we use. There's a very personal message, a photo of the campaigner, and an image that will evoke some sort of emotion. Cute puppies always work, um, children always work, and um, if you have them, right? Uh, so the consumer is the hero. Um, it's, up to, it's up to you to help this shelter win $10,000. So that's how we tried to position this, was that it's up to the consumer to really make this happen. Without you, it's not going to happen. Um, your vote in our new contest counts in more ways than you can imagine. Every person who votes is making a public statement in support of rescue and adoption, not puppy mills and overbreeding. So there's the, there's the, the framing for the story right there. It's good versus evil. You're the hero. And everyone who tells a friend, hint, hint, about the contest is spreading the word about amazing work animal rescue groups and shelters do every day to help save homeless animals. So animal shelters, the NGO is sort of the means. They're sort of the, the guardian, the, the mentor for making this happen. But you're the hero. You're the one that kind of facilitates the actual action. You can help today. Vote in our contest to help a group win a much needed donation. Then spread the word. Very clear call to action. It's not do 10 things. It's two things. Post your group's contest on Facebook and MySpace. Tweet it to your network. Send an email. Suggestions reinforcing the two very simple actions. And then keep it personal. So all of our campaigners sign their emails. It's from a personal email address like this, and it has their picture on it. Um, this We've invested probably millions of dollars and tens of thousands of hours in testing this. Please steal it. Um, and then, again, fulfill the consumer's need. Um, this email got me to open it, and I received thousands of these emails from Care2 every day. Because it, uh, it, it, it's, it, I think it had my name in the subject line, and then it said, "Do you have a pet?" Well, yes, I do. I have a dog. Um, a special little someone who's always there when you come home, who just wants to be loved and be loved. Totally got me because that's what my dog does. Um, so, um, and then it was specific, it was timely, and it was local. So there was an urgency to it. It was local to my hometown, which is Boulder, Colorado, and um, it was a very specific single call to action. Um, and then there was urgency. So it also evoked the question, this is really important with storytelling. If you think about some of the best movies that you watch or the best TV shows that you might like, um, the ones that always get you sort of leave you hanging at the end. <clears throat> so you don't, wanna, you, don't, you don't wanna spill all of your story in, in one single email. You wanna stretch it out. You want people to stay engaged and, and you wanna use every single instance you can think of to reach out to people. So. This was sort of you know, a deadline, and it also evoked the question, what happens next? So I wanted to know what was going to happen at the end of the contest. Well, the result was we had like 500,000 people vote in the contest. Um, and uh, there were tens of thousands of animal shelters that ended up being helped. 
um, who were added to this database, got exposure, and uh, CARE2, as a result, also grew their email list by about uh, 200,000 people. So when you go back, or later on today, think about your campaigns. Think about the last campaign that you ran. And so did it do these things? Did, did you, uh, oops, typo there. Did you um, meet your supporters' needs to be part of a group, to be creative, and to have their voices heard? And did you tell a story? Pretty simple. It'd be pretty easy to look back at your last campaign to figure out if you did those things. <clears throat> so, um, what are you gonna do about this? As I mentioned, you have a huge potential here just based on the data uh, that we looked at. So, um, when you go back, um, I want you to think about uh, one simple thing that you can do to start to reach the potential of your organization to you know, have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of supporters. Um, this was a, a shot that I took at uh, Saved Our Four rally in Washington, D.C. There were about 100,000 people that showed up. The reason there were 100,000 people sh that showed up is because Saved Our Four uh, had spent lots of time building an email list and as a result, they were also in the media in a big way. Um, they leveraged all the tools in the right way at the right time. Um, obviously, we haven't saved our four yet, but um, from a campaigning perspective, it's, it's uh, one, of the, one of the most brilliant examples I've seen. So three keys of online campaigning. Be prepared to be lucky, right tool for the right purpose, and meet the needs of your supporters. Um, all of these things are extremely important. It's very basic, it sounds very basic, but we often forget the basics and we just chase the tools or the trends. Um, but all of these things have been sort of true about any type of uh, communications throughout history. It's, it's really about meeting human needs and then taking advantage of, of these opportunities and being ready for them. So <clears throat> I thought it might be appropriate to end with a quote from uh, one of the most horrible capitalists ever, um, <clears throat> Donald Trump, a uh, real estate gazillionaire. Um, so, but I like this, it sort of evokes, uh, he evokes kind of this edge that I think a lot, a lot of campaigners have in changing the world. And he wasn't just satisfied with earning a good living, he really wanted to make a statement and just make an obscene living. Um, so let's think about that in terms of our, our email lists and our, our ability to you know, achieve our missions. We have a really huge potential here to to, to make a statement and, and you know it's just at the beginning of this. And don't forget to keep the people that benefit in mind. That's why you do what you do. Uh, it's not about you, it's about them. Thank you very much. First of all, it's a completely different approach to the first speaker. And I'd be happy to take questions. We have an, uh, roughly 15 minutes. So whoever feels um, he wants to ask something, go ahead. Yeah, Matthias Fellner from the Klimapiraten. Um, I've got a question. On the one hand, thank you for the presentation. Great um, issues you had. Um, well, I think you touched two points that are very important for Germany. On the one hand side, the lack of humor, um, which we always have and we probably will keep on having. Um, <laughs> and the second one is the view on the strategy where I think German NGOs can still learn a lot from American or British NGOs. Um, and I think it's probably because, because it's not so entertaining as doing nice activism on the streets um, to sit down and just take a one or two month um, of just looking at target groups and stuff like that. Um, but what I'm wondering, and there I'm not so sure whether the United States are much better than we are, um, is for example a campaign Avar started about three weeks ago um, where they wanted to abolish prostitution. Nice goal. Um, <laughs> and um, they raised uh, 400,000 euros in exactly two days. Um, and um, I was quite angry about their campaign um, and I wrote them an email and I said, well, nice target, but how are you going to abolish the oldest job um, on earth um, with 400,000 euros? Um, nice you have them, nice you have so many emails, but what are you going to do against it? And nobody did answer me that question. And there I say, well, if I understood your message right, um, get more money, get more emails, and you will succeed with your goal. Um, but I'm really wondering how is Avas going to do 
anything with such a big amount of money, and I'm quite sure that probably organizations um, like Amnesty International would say it's a catastrophe that campaigns like that are starting and are being so successful because they're probably harming more um, the, um, the politi political issue on prostitution than really gaining it. Yeah, so that's my question is, Ava is going sure. to succeed with that. Yeah, I mean, that, it's, it's an interesting debate. Um, I, my take on that is um, I, I would disagree slightly, and I would look at the longer term, because none of these issues, I mean, all these issues have been here throughout history, whether it's poverty or prostitution or any sort of uh, oppression. Um, they're not going to change overnight. But um, think about uh, the benefit of that campaign was that now there are probably, uh, you know, I, I never cease to be amazed how um, uninformed most of the world is about these issues. And if you think about the flip side of that, um, they just reached however many people, I don't know how many people signed the petition or whatever, million, whatever, 100,000, whatever it was. There's potentially that many more people that are now aware of that issue. And so if you think about sort of the cycle of engagement or you know, the ladder of engagement, in, in whether it's convincing people to buy a product or making change happen, it, there's a cycle to it and there's a, a stage of progression. So. Um, we've seen at CARE too, you know, there's oftentimes this um, term, which I don't really like because I don't think it's accurate, and it's called, it's slacktivism, um, where it's, you know, making it too easy to be an activist. Well, I think that's wrong because um, most people don't have time to be activists. They're not aware of the issues. They're just busy getting on with life, right? So the internet offers, offers this opportunity to educate massive, massive amounts of people, and that's really the first part of this, is getting people to understand that there are problems that are outside of their little universe of going to the grocery store, going to work, eating, taking care of the kids, right? So that's the potential that online is having is it makes it easier for people to be engaged and start to learn about things. And we've seen people go on care too from never knowing about, I mean, my own experience personally has been from, you know, relative, I grew up in a relatively conservative family in a conservative town, was just not quite as aware as I should have been about global issues until I really started to travel. And now, uh, you know, I'm at the point where I started an NGO, human rights in Africa. But, it all, you know, it all started with education. So I think that's the missing part of this. And it, as long as you're at it, why not make money that's going to help educate more people in the process and eventually solve these problems? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, hi, my name is Rosalie. Um, I come from Switzerland, and um, uh, I come here as an uh, online communication manager for Swiss NGO. But I'm also an activist for a, for an NGO that's working exactly on this subject. I'm I'm very very uh, angry about this uh, Avas campaign, um, and it's not about pr prostitution; it's about trafficking. Yeah. And so I don't know what they are raising money and not talking to grassroots NGOs like we are. And um, I mean, I don't know what they are doing with the money. This is not an efficient way to uh, find political solutions for the problem of trafficking. Um, they should be speaking with us first before they start a campaign like that. So I don't think that's the right way to do it. It's okay to raise money. It's okay to raise money to um, to uh, fulfill your political um, objects, but it's um, not okay if you do it on your own without speaking with the people that have been working for a lot of years, for decades on that subject. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, I guess that was more of a comment than a question to you. Sure. Um, do you have a question? <coughs> yeah, my, my comment was cool presentation and I liked your formula for motivation. Could you show that again? You had a formula for motivation. For, um, Remember? <laughs> Sorry, sorry, I didn't quite, for... You had a formula for motivation? For motivation. Could you show that again? <laughs> uh, it's the quote or the... First slide, maybe. <laughs> Did you have a specific question around that uh, quote? No, just wanted to see it again. Okay. That one? Maybe we have okay. some questions or... Oh, wow, cool, let's, let's have a question. That's cool, because that was actually, that was something that really uh, startled me. I mean, I, I know this quote, 
But I, I do have a problem right there because I think, I mean, I'm really happy you're talking about education and educating people yeah. because, I mean, whoa, great, money. But I totally don't believe you can sol solve problems with money because money yeah. sometimes is totally disgusting for people if they just see, you know, oh, you got a problem, get the money. It's like, no, be interested in my problem. That's way more important, right? But if you say motivation, blah, 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 it's kind of, that's manipulation. That's not motivation. Motivation is way more genuine, and I think that's, I mean, I'm a master of fake myself, you know, all that stuff that you were talking about, I mean, we did that too in like 95, 96, we called it drama marketing and shock marketing and all that. It's all great, but I think that's, that's over the top, and it's really, it's, it's hindering, and it's really, it, it creates problems. I, I mean, I, there's an edge, and plus, the other thing, you know, coming from America and doing stuff in Europe, you can't just, it's not two sides of the same coin. No, no, I, and, my, and there's my, just this, my point well, wasn't to say America's better than Europe. No, 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 it didn't come across like that. Yeah. But it's more like, uh, you know, just the, the here, fact frankly. of, you know, what is tax deductible <clears throat> yeah. might, is a ma major factor if, you, you know, people will yeah. actually spend money. And so it's just a bit more complex and I, um, and you know, making change happen, well, it's not really successful in the States at all. You know, it's, that's bullshit, I'm sorry. You know, the re I mean, I loved your presentation, very motivating, but you know. But <coughs> it's complete bullshit. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that, the, you were really motivating. I'm yeah. totally, you know, I, I totally agree, and I'm very thankful for you saying that you gotta be ready, because that yeah. lots of people totally fail in this, and it's really, really sad. Yeah. But you know, the change thing, Come on. Well, I, I'll disagree slightly. I mean, there, there have been some pretty massive political changes, whether it's here or in the US, and, and all that happened through lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of mobilization and small actions and organizing. And all of those principles, whether you're starting a business and launching a product and trying to get the word out or trying to convince people to do something differently, that takes lots and lots of repetition and lots and lots of campaigning. I mean, just, that doesn't just happen miraculously. It's, there's a lot of sweat and work, and that doesn't happen without money. I mean, there's there's got to be money as part of it. Um, yeah. What's okay. that? Okay. There are. We oh, have wow. two questions. Uh, another two questions, and then I mean, I think it's a really interesting topic, yeah. so everybody's very interested. But maybe we can then f take just two more questions, and then the rest. Justin is still around for. Others. For, I, for, <laughs> for the day. Yeah. Okay. I allow myself to have a question. Um, we, we talked very big scale so far. Gerd talked about you need to hold social movement first, then add social media to it. Care2 is very successful. It's big already, of us, it's big already, but I guess we have a few people in here who are more like in social startups or in locally focused niche issues. So, what would you say on how to start off or how to leverage social media if I have a niche topic which is not like climate change or what everybody gets yeah. at, at once. How's that working? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because it's, <clears throat> it's probably more, um, um, more common than having the, the, bigger, the bigger campaigns. And it's, it's difficult to build, excuse me, from a grassroots perspective, it's very difficult to build a critical mass on a, a local level. So I think one way to think about it, you know, in terms of backing into the numbers, look at sort of the, the potential size of your population mm -hmm that you would like to reach, um, and then be realistic about uh, what percentage of that population uh, you can reach. So there's some advantages to local organizing that you don't have on a national scale, and that's, that's so you can actually meet people face to face. Um, so you can probably get a bigger percentage of a local uh, following, you know, local being like a city, um, or even a, or, you know, like a slightly bigger than a city, a, a state in the US, I guess the, a region here. Um, so that's, that's one thing. I think looking at what's possible with the potential universe. Uh, if there are only 10 people that care about your issue, you know, you're right, right. So, yeah, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing, I think there's a, a huge advantage to um, leveraging like uh, tools like Meetup and um, even uh, Facebook events for local organizing. Um, I think that's a tool that's really underused um, because you can reinforce it with that face-to-face, -face, uh, more personal interaction. And then you use the online piece to kind of uh, follow up with people and, and keep them engaged when they're not face-to-face. -face. Um, so those are a couple of tips I'd use for more 
local organizing, but I think it's very difficult to have enough of a critical mass to um, like raise a significant amount of money for a local organization. Um, so you're probably better off doing like major gifts, um, you know, trying to get major donors or grant money. You'll, you'll do better. That's, that's what I've seen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We have one last question. Hi, um, thank you for this presentation. Um, Thanks. However, it looked very American to me. And um, I mean, I have Go to Go figure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but um, I mean, I'm not really sure if um, the American model, um, you know, of uh, the campaigns mm -hmm. could be uh, translated into Europe uh, effectively. Um, for example, the media is not the same in Europe. Um, relationship to money is not the same. Um, political activism is not the same. So, so first, what do you think are the main differences between um, effective campaign in Europe and effective campaign in America? And secondly, um, what do you think about um, how to fix these differences to make effective campaign in Europe? Um. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know enough about uh, European campaigning, so I was, uh, you know, I was asked to kind of share what we, what's happened in America, just to give you a glimpse of sort of what's working there. And it's natural that not everything I said here is, is going to work for different specific cultures. Um, but I think the principles can still probably apply, because what it boils down to really is human nature. And I don't think as humans we're super different. And what I'm talking about here is really more about how we behave as a species versus cultures. And there's obviously subtleties to that, um, but I think if you, if you start to think about these things in your campaigns, you're going to, to see, see more growth. Marcus, thank you very much. Thank you. And as I said, those who still want to discuss with Justin, he's still available and he's still around. So just go and grab him because I.